This chapter is pretty, uh, I, th I think it's pretty straightforward because it's, I expect for those of you that are already pretty comfortable with R, these concepts are not new. They actually, there's a lot of spillover um, from R. So there wasn't a lot of new information. The, no, the, the main, I guess, bits of new information I will cover, but even like the extension types, for example, but even Wes is like, this is more for advanced users, but I'm just gonna include it anyways. So anyways, these are the learning objectives. Um, so like uh, I think JD did last time, there uh, I used some real data, not the data that he used um, because I kind of wanted to visualize all of these um, uh, methods and kind of more consistently. And so this data actually is, um, I think from like the nineties, uh, certain food consumptions in Europe and Scandinavia by, uh, I guess, portion of the country that consume, that regularly consumes that food. Um, so there's like 21 variables here. Um, and to be honest, I think I spent more time finding a data set for this than actually going through the chapter because annoyingly data that is out there for analysis is clean. Like there's no missingness. And how do I write a section on missing data when there's no missing data? So I was finally able to find this data set that actually had some missingness. So I was happy about that. Um, so yeah, relative consumption of certain foods in Europe and Scandinavian. Uh, all right, so there are some things to consider when you are handling missing data. So uh, pandas, for example, by default excludes missing data and any uh, descriptive statistics that you do. Um, NAN, which is not a number, is mainly uh, used to indicate a missing float. Um, but some, these are something called sentinel values. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of that before. Um, honestly, this is some, I feel like this is something that's more referenced in like computer science or other things. Uh, Cause when I looked it up, they were mentioning things like C or C++ or something like this. Um, but I guess it would make sense in the Python context as well. But essentially these are values that are not really part of the input, but they have, they, they have a signal. So that like, NA, NAN, none, or whatever. These are values that um, are put in by, I guess, pandas or Python um, to represent that there is a missing value there where there uh, could be one. But you can also do it yourself. So often when we write functions and it doesn't like um, input doesn't really meet some criteria, we put negative one or some. Well, for me, I like to just do 99999 so that I know that this is not a real value. Um, so one thing to do is you can check if they have some missing by using the is na function. Um, so if you look at my data set food, there's only 16 rows. That's for each country. Um, and I'm only using for a lot of this uh, examples, I'm only using the yogurt column. Um, so there is only one country who is, has missing data on yogurt consumption. Um, so if I were to try to do some descriptive stats on, on yogurt, uh, they, I can use the mean function from NumPy, um, or I can use the average. And this is, I think, a discussion that I've been in before, the difference between means and averages, um, especially in regards to um, missing values. Um, I still don't get it. <laughs> There's a, uh, I looked it up. I tried to find some answer, but the only thing I could really take away is what is in the source code for these particular functions. So if I were to do mean of yogurt, it's going to give me 20.533, which is actually not I guess is the arithmetic mean because it removes that row. So it would basically take the sum of all of these percentages uh, divided by 15 instead of 16. Um, 
So it doesn't like treat it like zero or anything like that. Um, versus average gives you just a straight NAN. And according to the NumPy documentation, if you look into NP mean, I mean, sorry, from average, you see in the function that there is this little bit right here, kind of like uh, scrolls off the page a little bit, but you can see, I can scroll, oops, scroll all the way. And, no, 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 no. Oh, I think that's it. We just can. Um, so basically, you have uh, this um, sum array, some weight that you that you may have uh, passed. It defaults to none. And then you take the sum of that array and divide it by SCL, which is supposed to be um, the, oh, I, I probably should have included what SCL was, but it's basically the, the, um, the what's it called? I don't wanna say length, but, Yeah, I don't know. What ends up happening, I can't remember. What ends up happening is that you're basically dividing by an NAN, whatever SEL, um, uh, I guess, become like what it value, what the value of SEL is. Um, in this case, because there's a NAN, then that you have an NAN in the denominator. So average is going to return NAN versus mean. If you look at the source code for that, there is, um, it seems from what my, my understanding is, that there, that Python actually has a built-in mean function. It's in the statistics module. And if you, NumPy mean really just calls statistics mean. So that just takes the arithmetic mean and it just removes the, the, NA, uh, the NA value, the missing value and moves on. Um, so yeah, I kind of fell down the rabbit hole on this one. That's the only kind of rationale I could come up with. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of the NumPy U funks ignore NANs, uh, but not all of them do. And like you notice average doesn't because average has to, average is intended for a weighted average. It has an optional argument to give weights. So it's really right. meant for weighted average. And they actually have another one called ma.average, which is a masked average, which you're supposed to use if you do have NANs to try to, to block them out or mask them however you want to do. But yeah. I mean, there's also for me, there's NAN me. Yeah, there's nan mean, um, yeah. Exactly. But when I ran nan mean, it came in the same answer. So. Yeah, that's true. It seems um, like nan mean specifically, nan mean documentation specifically says it ignores the nans, whereas the mean documentation doesn't say that. So that's strange. But yeah. yeah. Mm. Interesting. But I think the thing I find the most weird is if you do this logic to see if they equal each other, it's false. Yeah, it is false. Uh, what I found was really weird um, because this is uh, some kind of floating point standard uh, that it abides by. So not a number doesn't equal itself. Yeah, the, the reason for that is so you don't run into issues like you don't want it. Like if you're trying to find if two data sources are equal to each other, NAN is actually non-determined because it could be anything essentially. So you, any, if one thing could be anything, it can't be equal to something else. It could be any other thing. So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The two NANs could be could be anything, but they could be different any things, I guess, is the logic. If that makes any sense, I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... It's like I, null too, right? I mean... Yeah, um, I guess yeah. nulls can't equal another. I mean, it, it does make sense because uh, like I was mentioning earlier, that these are sentinel values. And so yeah. they're really just there to kind of uh, flag that something, that maybe there's another value there or something else. Yeah. So you wouldn't really know what what it is. So I guess and from that perspective, it makes sense. But at this point, I was kind of spending too much on missing data. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave it at that. Kind of leave this little nugget in your head. Um, awesome. I've included the documentation uh, if you want to read more about it. All right. So there are several ways to filter missing data. Um, so there is, for example, drop NA, which we have also in the plier. Uh, so you basically uh, can include the option how uh, equal to all, which basically only removes the rows where um, there is every value is equal to NA. 
So it won't just remove. So and I, I think drop NA has the, and R has the same uh, act, um, um, behavior. So it will remove any row that contains an NA, but sometimes you only want to remove the ones where every value is, is not, is missing. Um, then there's something, uh, there's a one that's called fill NA, which we also have basically you fill any missing value with another missing value. Um, but you can also pass it, I'm sorry, not another missing value, a real value like zero. Um, but you can also pass in a dictionary if there are um, specific values that you want to, like two like different values that you want to replace. So for example, um, in this one, uh, we're just filling the missing values with zero in this case. Um, and then this is just a logical to check if is NA, which we also have in R. And there is the opposite. And this one I didn't really get, but I, maybe there's some people have use for it, which is just the inverse of is NA to so check the ones that are not NA. So you can tell, you can see here that these are, these are the opposite. Um, all right, let's move on to data transformations section two, which has a lot of pieces. Uh, so one thing that is maybe helpful is to check for duplication. Uh, there is a lovely function called duplicated, which returns a logical for every um, everything. Uh, so when I put in when I pass in food, everything every row is unique. So this is this makes sense. They're not duplicated. Um, but what I did was I basically created a new uh, data frame, which is the yogurt the yogurt column twice. Uh, so that we, basically they would, there would be duplicates. Um, but what I found weird was, and we can see what this looks like, it's exactly the same. It didn't give me what I expected. So for example, drop duplicates, will drop the first observed value where there is a duplicate. So it dropped indices 11 and 12. For some reason it was, it recognized that as a duplicate. And if you put, if you pass in the option keep equals last, which looks kind of scans through all of them, it removes indices six and 10. So I don't understand really what's going on behind the scenes because these rows are exactly the same. So in theory, these are all duplicates. So I don't know how it's coming up with these um, particular indices to drop. And also the same for if you just want a specific subset. So if you only want to drop the duplicates um, for the subset of one column. And again, only 11 and 12 are dropped. So whatever that behavior is mimicking the drop duplicates. Well, what, what was the, what was in 11 and 12? Twos or no, sixes? I mean, same thing as on row six. Well, you can't. Uh... I'm just asking about 11 and 12, the row 11 and 12. Yeah, what that's what a good point. What it originally looked like. Uh, let, let me just... Do you have dupe food around somewhere? Yeah, I probably should have printed that. Uh, here it is. If you go here. Sorry. Take your eyes a little bit. Um. Okay. Oh, you're right. Okay, that makes sense. Because this, wait. Yeah, no, so 11 is a duplicate of six. So, so that means 11 gets dropped. And 12 is a duplicate of 
10, so 12 should get dropped. Yeah, that seems to be doing the right thing. Oh, I was completely thinking about it like the opposite. Okay, well, good to know. Yay. <laughs> All right, so yeah, um, okay. now I get it. So uh, 11 and 12, because they're duplicates of um, uh, six and 10. Yeah. yeah, whatever was there before. <laughs> Um, and so this seems to be doing the, the expected behavior in that sense. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. So there was two, there were, there are rows where they're exactly the same, like the, each of the values. I think I confused myself when I took the same column, for each of them. <laughs> like just basically like the duplicated the entire column, but that's on me. All right, so um, trans uh, data transformation. So oftentimes it's probably helpful to transform um, some data, let's say if you have like some missing or if you want to just uh, add new information. Um, and again, this is similar to the apply family in R or if you like per like I do, um, I use all the map functions. And luckily it's also called map. In, in pandas. So what we can do here, let's say if we wanted to add the most popular yogurt brands for each of the countries, um, I can specify the dictionary. So for each of them, I kind of just put um, each of these um, yogurt brands and I, I subset uh, just for the first five for simplicity. Uh, and I define this function that says, all right, let's get the yogurt pass an X, which is going to be the, um, the country and then get the yogurt that is associated with that country. So if we wanted to create a new um, variable called brand in our data frame, then we can just get uh, the country, basically the data that you're gonna map over and call map and specify the function that that data is gonna go uh, iterate over. Um, this is a little bit different uh, than per because in per, you your the first argument is usually the data that you're gonna iterate over followed by the function, unless it is in like a pipe and then you can like pipe the data and then you don't have to really specify it or you can put like the dot notation or whatever. Um, but it's pretty standard this way uh, in pandas. At least I haven't used it in any other way besides data dot map. So these are one of these. This is definitely one of those um, things that kind of annoy me with pan, uh, Python in general. Like sometimes you can specify uh, your all the arguments inside the parentheses of a function, but sometimes you have to call it outside. So something dot function. And I can never remember like what is the appropriate um, way to do it. Uh, to me, it's not very consistent. Um, all right, so uh, sometimes you're gonna wanna replace values. If something seems weird or incorrect, or again, maybe like with missing, for example. Um, so using the replace function, there is a replace function here. So you can do, let's say for example, that, um, I don't like the values of yogurt for Germany. So whatever there's a 30 or just in general, I don't like 30, then I will replace 30 with 50. I mean, it's a very nonsensical example, but I think you can get the picture. So what ended up happening was there 30% of Germans uh, reported that they consume yogurt regularly. And so I just decided I wanna change that to 50 by using the replace function, which is up here. So it's uh, data.replace, the thing you wanna replace with the new replacement. <laughs> um, and then you can do the same thing for more than one value. Um, and with this, you can you do it in a list. So uh, 30, I wanna replace with 20, uh, sorry. 30, I want to replace with 50, 20, I want to replace with 40. So a list of the things that you want to replace with the things that you're replacing them with. So in this case, uh, Belgium 
we went from 20 to 40. Um, but sometimes you want to rename, rename your indices. So by default, you get a lovely, you know, starting from zero, you have zero to 16 as our indices. And we can look here, you can call dot index. And this is also another thing that I also don't understand when sometimes you specify parentheses and sometimes you don't have to put the parentheses. Um, but I think this is, I think maybe a property of a, the um, data frame. So I guess you don't have to, but anyways, um, because this is just the subset, there are uh, the indexes from zero to five. So you know that there are uh, one, the indices are zero, one, two, three, four, um, and five. So that's six rows. So we can change that if we want to make these actual names. Uh, there are a couple ways to do that. You can map also, like um, as we've done before, but this time you can, instead of writing out the function um, in isolation, like on top, we can use the lamp, what's called the lambda function, where you kind of ex like express your function within the function within like the map function that you're trying to uh, iterate over. So in this case, we're basically taking whatever value that this is and then adding 10 to it. Or, and so that, or that basically gives us 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, no reason, just, just for example. Um, but what if I wanted to actually make those values maybe a little bit more meaningful by putting the first letter of the country name? So in this instance, I would just pass in a dictionary. And so it would just map in whatever matching value to a uh, key with its value and replace it with the value. I said that completely. It will map over the dictionary and match the index to the key and replace it with its value. Okay. Um, sometimes you're gonna wanna um, bin certain things, like certain data. This is um, really common to do in you know, stats um, with histograms and things like that. So what we can do is we can define a, you can predefine your bins and we, um, for those of you that's done some stats, that's pretty uh, common to do. Maybe you have some cut points that are meaningful in your data, or you can just let uh, the function do it to you, do it for you that are uh, that are equally divided. Um, so, for example, I want to categorize the percentages this way. This is what I find meaningful, 0 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, and 50 to 70. Um, so we can use the PD cut function, and it does exactly what it sounds like it's going to do. It's going to cut up that data based on uh, what, where, that, where it falls in, this, in these bins. So when you print it out, this is when it's going to return which um, bins that value belongs to. And what's interesting is that the val the, the type of the this object is of type category. Um, I've never worked with categories before, um, but they do sound like they would be helpful um, with performance. Potentially, uh, he goes over this a little bit in the conclusion and and, and the last section of categorical data, um, but not in too much not in too much detail. Um, and it, it it tells you the categories uh, in the output, so you can see that there are four categories, and this is what they are. Um, all right, so. What if I wanted to count the number of bins in each category? I'm sorry, the number of values in each category. Um, you would have to use value counts in this in this instance because value counts is uh, appropriate for um, string variables uh, and categorical, so like non non numerical data. Um, so you can see that. 
if we were to count the number of values that fe fell in each of the bins, then this is what it would look like. So most of the countries kind of fall in the zero to 20 range for yogurt. All right, so I can kind of use that same idea um, and just kind of combine it all together to maybe give some more meaningful uh, categories to these um, bins. And so I can set a list for each of these values that I'm choosing to bin. And then basically apply those as uh, pass those as the label option in the PD cut function. And then, you know, just for simplicity, I wrap all of that in value count. So you don't have, you know, kind of save some lines. So we see that this is what it ends up uh, looking like. And there are two countries where they report over 70% yogurt consumption. All right, so um, like I said before, you can also let pandas do the work for you by supplying a number of bins and um, a, pre a precision point for the number of decimal, decimal places. Um, so if I say I wanna make four categories, it will divide up my data into four equal categories and with you know, no more than two, two decimal places. So we see here that this is what it came up with. Honestly, like this, I prefer my way because then that's something more meaningful to me, but you know, it is, it is what it is. You'll have use case for that. But uh, notice that there is, uh, instead of cut, you use Q cut. All right. Um, let's Just talk a about quick point mm -hmm. of clarification. You can, you can use cut there too. Q cut does a quart, 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 yeah, quartile cut. So instead of being equal intervals, you've got equal numbers in each interval, equal counts in each interval, or you should, or close to equal, I guess. But. Yeah, um, totally right. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, no worries. Uh, okay, um, so then we move on to outliers. How do we handle the outliers? Well, you could just toss them if you want. But sometimes that uh, you know may be indicative of something that could be wrong. So or maybe you only want to study the outliers. So the way we can fi find that is one, you have to determine what is considered an outlier. So in my example, I am going to set anything that's above 50% as an outlier. So we have two. So if I run basically subset, um, the yogurt column by the value, the um, the rows that I evaluate where the absolute value evaluates to true. I can't speak. It's already the end of the day. Where it's where its absolute value is greater than fifty equals true. Ugh. So we have two. I don't know which countries those are. But what if we wanted to know, like, just more generally, any food whatsoever? This way, because I want to know, like, what <coughs> excuse me, what the outliers are. Now, this may not be like a very reasonable example because it may just be very intuitive. But I'm not going to like put use the 50 uh, cutoff anymore because now I have more uh, 20 other variables I could work with. So I, I bumped it up to 95. Um, what foods kind of, what countries kind of fall in that 95% consumption? So when I um, subset by that, and the thing is that I think is important to note here is if I wanted to look at the uh, rows that satisfy this condition um, versus uh, look at, at any of the rows that satisfy that condition versus before we only we only passed in one uh, variable, we would use the any function. And this is similar in R as well. Um, so we can say any of the variables meet this, uh, have rows that meet this condition, include it. But one thing that you have to specify here is that you want your access, access to be the columns. 
So it's going to like uh, which evaluate through the columns any rows that satisfy this condition versus indices. So um, there are seven countries that meet this criteria. So we can very clearly see that coffee is widely consumed unless you're in this country or in this country where tea makes up um, the most consumed thing. And I am willing to bet this is probably somewhere in the UK. Um, all right. I hope that all makes sense so far. I feel like these are concepts that are pretty familiar for anyone that does data analysis with R or any other, actually with any other software, because uh, these are things that you have to do on the regular. Um, perm permutation and random sampling. What's the difference? Permuting uh, could, and, and randomly permuting, I, I guess, is reor ra random reordering. Um, the function you want to use for that comes from NumPy. Uh, the random module. So you can say NP random permutation and basically pass it the length of the axis that you want to permute versus random sampling basically means that it's going to um, take a sample of your data with equal probability uh, where every value has an equal chance of being chosen. So if we apply that to our, our yogurt uh, data, then we can say um, give me five random um, indices from my yogurt data. So it's spit out two, three, zero, one, and four. Um, and we can pass in take. So we can pass that into the function take, which the way I kind of uh, compared it to, like take anyways in my mind was similar to pull. I'm, but maybe I'm, I'm missing something critical there for R, I mean. Um, so you can basically, you can pass that in and it will return the, those indices of the data frame. So we can see they return France, Italy, Holland, the Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium. Um, this can be really useful actually when you're using iLook um, and I think we covered iLoke in the last, last chapter, but we can pass in this permutation that we want to take, but we want to permute on columns. Um, and that's the axis uh, that you must specify in this instance, otherwise it defaults to um, the, the indices. So instead, it's going to take five random uh, columns. Um, taking a random sample without replacement, you can just call the sample function, specify how many you want. And if you want replacement, all you have to do is set replace equal to true. So if I take five, um, a random sample of five countries from my data set, this is what I get. All right, indicator or slash dummy variables. Um, very helpful for machine learning, like regression and things like that, like logistic regression, for example, um, where you need to convert a categorical variable to zero and one. So pandas has a nifty little function called get dummies. So you can pass in your, you know, your categorical variable there and uh, it will return each of <clears throat> um, matrix in this case of zero and one, which makes sense because each row is unique. So every country, there's only going to be one in each row. Uh, so like the first row was for Germany. Um, but he does make note that, and I'm pretty sure all of you are pretty pretty aware of this. Um, in chapter 13, when they go through real, like real world examples, that will obviously make more sense. Um, all right, this is what I was talking about, uh, section three, something called extension data types. I don't know if we have uh, something similar in R, maybe we do and I just don't know, but 
apparently that apparently there are some shortcomings in the development of NumPy um, that left things a little, you know, difficult uh, to handle, such as um, doing string computations. And if you have a lot of strings, then it becomes computationally expensive. Um, converting missing data, as we've seen before. Um, anything that's related to time, so date objects, time series, things like that, couldn't we're not supported. So Pandas has kind of also included these types that are extended to fix these issues. We're not fixed, I guess, address them. So for example, if you wanted to see the type of um, object that you're working with, you call in um, uh, D type. So I have a, a series, I just create a series here and it is going to return float, float 64 specifically. Um, but because this is a, a I guess a pandas uh, function and you want to make a series, it supports um, it, a, like uh, specifying the type that you need. Um, so in this case, we want this to be int 64 type. So if you were to get the D type, it's going to return an int 64 instead of a float. Um, let's see. So you can do again, like with is NA. Um, this, so I didn't print it. I should have printed this uh, series, but with none, if I were to print this series now, it, it returns NA in um, angle brackets like this. Um, this is like the way pandas handles the, the none value as an int type. Um, so if you were to check, the, the logic, make sure it actually uh, is true. You can use the is um, and get PD NA and it evaluates to true. So it, they're, they're, they're the same thing. So that's pandas sentinel value. So it converted, uh, didn't convert, but it links the uh, pandas NA to the angle bracket NA. These things, these kind of things, to be honest, are things I don't really think about uh, when I'm doing these in my day to day. Um, but I guess it's kind of good to put in the back of your head. Um, and he does say in the chapter that this is kind of really advanced for this book, but for the sake of completeness, I'm going to uh, include it. Um, but let's say you've already have your data object and you want to. Um, change the types, you can always do it with as type. So if we have this data frame here, we can convert each uh, column into a different type. So we want the first one to be integer, the second to be string, and the third to be a Boolean. So if I were to print that data frame now, we would get one, two, you see that NA in the angle brackets where it was none. Um, same thing here as a string. And then same thing for the Boolean. I think this is this is pandas just uh, doing its thing. But there's a whole he provides a whole table of extension types that uh, you can find here that I've linked to it. Okay, the fun stuff: string manipulation. Um, as much as I complain when I'm actually in it, I, I I do kind of enjoy doing string manipulation because it's a each one is kind of like a puzzle for me anyways, because I'm, I'm not uh, versed in regular expressions. Um, but there are some pre-built, like there are some built-in uh, string functions that you can, do, you can use out of the box. So for example, split, join, strip, in, count, and replace. Um, I think these are named pretty well because that's exactly what they do. <laughs> um, and there are more here. In this link. So let's say I had this, this string, it's a sentence. I'm going to apply each of these, like th these are the ones that I feel are pretty common. Uh, 
and apply each of those functions to the, uh, the sentence. So if I were to split on LB, um, oh man, I didn't print all of them. I should have wrapped them all in print. It's, it's weird because in Quarto, when I look at the, um, the viewer, like the, what's it called? Not the code version, the other version that you can now toggle. Um, it prints all of them. So that code chunk, and then I run that code chunk, it prints all of the, uh, each of these, but when it rendered, it only does the last one, which is what I was expecting at first, to be honest, because that's when I'm in Jupyter notebooks, you know that only the last one gets printed. Yeah, I, I was about to say, it's like a Jupyter notebook when it actually renders, it's good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but when I was in the, in QMB Porto, it was printing all of them. So it was, I don't know, I, I thought that would just transfer, but. It, this basically does what you would expect. So um, LB split is going to con is going to split each of these uh, this text into each uh, I guess string based on the default. Uh, actually, I, I think the default is a white space, but you can specify here whatever you specify as being your breakpoint. It will split on that. So you basically you you end up with. Um, uh, I want to say a list of each of the words in that um, string. Strip is going to strip off the white, the like it's trim, strip and trim, like trims off the the white space on the end. So this white space uh, here, when I say white space, I mean I guess blank space. I'm not sure if I'm using the right word. But you that it returns the the string the whole string with those uh, stripped off. Um, join actually confused me a little bit uh, because I thought it was going to join each of these words with a dash, but it actually puts a dash in between every character. So you get l dash a dash y dash l dash a, and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm sure there's a way to specify what is the uh, the, the right length or pattern to, um, um, on which to join a new character. Um, you can apply logic to it, so you can see if a certain uh, pattern is in your string. Um, this is very similar to R. Um, you can count how many times something is a, a certain pattern exists in your string. So in this case, you know, if I wanted to see how many adjectives are in the string, I would use the comma, considering. I'm just kind of assuming that this uh, I, I use proper grammar uh, with my comma placements. Um, and then you can replace, use the replace function to replace anything in that string with something else. So in this instance, I decided to replace the ellipses with another, with another string. Um, all right, so our beloved regular expressions. Um, <clears throat> really useful when you know how to do it, but it often takes a lot of trial and error in my experience. Uh, I still refer to the cheat sheet from RStudio. So the stringer package has the whole back page is regular expressions. Um, but for Python, you have to import, uh, to start using regular expression, you have to import the RE module. So, I, for example, have uh, this text where I lived in Philadelphia County, Miami-Dade County, and Rockville County. Um, so let's say I just wanted to split on white space. And this one uh, is a little bit straightforward. So you have, this is your expression for, sorry, I thought like I was gonna sneeze, uh, white space. I guess space, I think you probably need to stop calling it white space, just space in general, the space character, uh, which is denoted by this. And the plus sign means more than just one. So there's going to be for all of the spaces strip on, uh, split on that. So that, that's what you end up with a list with each string uh, on its own, um, each word as its own string. Um, but what you can do, which I found might be really interesting and useful is that 
you can actually compile a regular expression and store it as a new object. So you can you can continuously use it throughout your script instead of like copy and pasting your um, your exp uh, expression. So in this instance, you know there you can compile your uh, white. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop saying that. Your space character. <laughs> um and just plop into the compile function but as a side note here just remember when you're working with regular expressions that there are special characters that are reserved for regular expressions that you need to escape out of if you need them some of them are like the uh the period the comma the plus sign the colon things like that um so just out of curiosity Let's say my question was, what if I wanted to extract the counties from my sentence? I'm going to compile that just because I can um, and set this pattern. So something that is, I guess, is a, was a little bit different um, from R, because if you use any of the stringer uh, functions, you can specify your pattern by putting it in open close parenthesis. Uh, quotes, uh, and then bracket, at least that's what I used to do. I used to put them in brackets. Um, but this one, you have to include the R in front of your pattern, um, which I took me a lot of tries to remember. It was throwing me an error. So like, oh, wait, what is this little R thingy? Um, so essentially what this is saying is that <laughs> Uh, you're like ser forward searching. So there's like different anchors and regular expression. I'm not gonna get too much into it. So they're, they're, from my understanding, they're, you can anchor to the end, from the end or from the beginning of a, of a string. And then you have kind of like this any, so the question mark with an asterisk or just, I think just a question mark um, with an equal sign plus a white space. Damn it. space, <laughs> a space character, um, basically means like anywhere. Um, and then followed by county. So you have word plus somewhere there is a space and followed by the, the word county, the pattern county. I may be completely like, miss missing messing that up but this is what i ended up getting so <laughs> I, I guess i did it right um and i did that by using the find all uh function from the i think it's one of the built-in string functions talking about string functions so you can do things with string function like you can actually do like different things with strings um, I'm not going to get too much into it. So this is kind of repeating some of the examples before, but I'm using his data in the book, um, which just has names and um, um, email addresses. So it, it, he converts it to a series, I guess, it, to kind of handle that one. Um, but it allows us to, by being a series, you can apply the functions uh, such as like group by, like the ones that are, are array oriented. Um, so for example, logic to, to see if it um, contains the word Gmail. Um, vectorized element retrieval. So there's like this, here's the pattern for an email address and then using the find all with the uh, option to ignore case. Um, and then with, like I said, with categorical, with this kind of, I guess, data like string categorical, um, you can use value counts. So that's, like I mentioned, something that you use for um, categorical data, categorical data, followed by, so, you know, we do this PD series again to kind of, you know, ensure it's a, interpret uh, it as a series. And then, oh, this is what I was talking about earlier about objects of type category um it's because if you're doing like very extensive calculation uh computations 
um, it may be worthwhile kind of categorizing your data, which kind of converts them into uh, numbers and then replacing them later. So, um, for example, we have this data, apple, orange, apple, apple, and that's repeated twice. Um, and what you can do is you can assign a new series with the values. So we assign zero to apple and one to orange. And if you, what you can do now, your values are uh, kind of stored as zeros and ones. But if you want to retrieve the original set, you can use uh, the take uh, function again to get your values back. So I thought that was pretty interesting, um, considering you know I'm, I'm working a lot with you know kind of NLP stuff, and it may be interesting to play around with this. Um, I feel like this is kind of self-explanatory. Um, you now can do things like uh, group by, aggregate, um, things like that when you uh, kind of then and categorize your, your data. Okay, that's it. Yeah, on time, shop. <laughs> Yeah, with a little bit of room at the beginning to, to mess up. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? I hope this was pretty like straightforward, right? Like, I don't think there was any concept that was really that novel. I thought Thank it was you. good. Yeah, great. I yeah. particularly like the fact that you used your own data set rather than just copying what was in the book. And that's like, I'm going to start doing that now when I go through the rest of the chapters, because it helps you really internalize and, and, and see what's exactly. happening. That was a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, they I, don't I stick it. with the, the book <laughs> examples because it's like every, every topic has its own data set. And mm -hmm. so, it, yeah, like you said, it doesn't really stick for me. Yeah. So, so also last week, um, there's something that, uh, um, what her name, she did this something with um, new data set. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. It, it was quite interesting. Thank you, um, Leila and Sujio. Uh, next week, we're going to have, I think, Olua Femi, right? Um, to walk us through chapter oh, eight. You are, you are the ones who take us through chapter eight. I'm taking chapter nine. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. So I think uh, uh, anyone with question? I had a quick question. I, well, I wanted to just confirm my understanding of the missing values, because if I understand correctly, NAN and R means undefined, and NA means missing. But it seems like in Python, they're the same thing, um, like the at least like in my brief lookup, that's what I gathered. But if anybody has more insight, please let me know. I I thought I thought it was the same in R as well. So NANs are reserved for um, like floats, um, and then nulls are for for strings. But at the same time, like I, this also confuses me. Um, Nah, I think it's a historical NA, thing. None. <laughs> yeah, there's none too. <laughs> yeah, there is none. That's a Python type, right? Yeah. yeah. So, the, what I understood is that the, and this may be wrong, so you know, don't quote me on this, but the original, like the NumPy, is mainly just for numbers. NumPy is all about numbers, and so their NAN means not a number; it really means what it is. And then pandas, because it's built on NumPy, started using NAN as NA as well. And that caused these problems you mentioned earlier, why they started introducing these new types. What do you call them? What do they call them again? Extension types. Extension types, yeah, to deal with that. And then they introduced their own NA, Panda, PD.NA, which is supposed to be not available or whatever. So that so you can, there are there are two. PDNA is not available. And NumPy.NAN is not a number. But um, Panda's NA function rec recognizes both of them as being not available, I guess. Is NA will recognize. I think, it, both I think it handles them both the same. I yeah, think you can expect the same behavior with both. I mean, um, I think if you if you if you look think if you look at it, and you think it's a bit clunky. 
you had the right idea. It is a big Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> For me, like just in practice, if something goes like it doesn't look right, I just try something else. It's just trial and error for me. Like it just doesn't stick. Even with R, like these, I guess, NA values, um, they always threw me off. Like I, I, I'm, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Is that how we all work? I mean, that's how I do things. I, mean, I just, yeah. yeah. Like who, who can claim that they just like are perfect in programming? I hope, hope nobody watches me do it. data analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you think that was gonna work? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you really can't explain. Like, try to explain this. I, I just just try and tell it works. That's usually my response. Yeah. Okay. So I will be the one. I, I forgot. I didn't even know. Like the next chapter, that data wrongly. Um, That's you. Next week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I'll, I'll see, see you next you time. All. Next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Okay. Bye, bye. bye, -bye.